Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 85, October 31st to November 6th, 1862. Let me say, once again, happy Halloween to everyone listening, first and foremost. Last week, we went over two smaller skirmishes in Louisiana and Missouri. Drawing a conclusion on the Perryville and Corinth campaigns, we talked about the significance of those two battles. This week, we turn our attention back to Virginia. We have a cavalry raid on Barbie Station, But first, we have to tie up one loose end. A couple of weeks ago, we tied off loose ends with the Battle of Antietam. We kind of talked about drawing a close on George B. McClellan, but today we are going to have to finally say goodbye, at least to his military career. Before we do that, though, I do want to mention we have some new Patreon content We have a memoir review that should be posted here by the time this episode airs, and that is going to be Hardtack and Coffee, and I mentioned in a previous episode here, the draw on this one is that it's a lot about the life of a Civil War soldier, uh, not so much combat experience like some of these other memoirs, so it is fairly unique in that regard. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, we do have a link to the Patreon here in the description. And once again, your support for the show is greatly appreciated. So first, we are going to talk about what happens directly after the Battle of Antietam. When Lee gets away at Shepherdstown, it would not surprise you to find out, perhaps, that McClellan does not pursue him. In Little Mac's mind, the job was done. He had defeated Lee and thwarted his invasion attempt. There was no destruction of the Confederate Army on the schedule. Back to friendlier soil, Lee would sit with the Army of Northern Virginia at Winchester. McClellan would wish to reorganize and refit the Army in the meantime. In a repeat of his mood when he was in Washington, Everything needed to be right. President Lincoln would make a visit to the Union camp in the meantime. His concern was that the young Napoleon was squandering the remaining campaign season. On October 1st, Lincoln arrived outside Sharpsburg and conferred with his commanding general. There were several famous photographs taken of their meetings, There's one in particular that comes to mind. There's one where they're sitting in a tent together, and hopefully I'll be able to post that to the website so you can take a look. McClellan took the same tack he unfortunately tried while on the peninsula, advising the president against his current path to a less than conservative course. You see, the intention for emancipation had been announced, in par to the course McClellan was not keen on it. Walking away from the meeting, Little Mac thought it went well, but most likely the president had already made the decision to replace the commander of the Army of the Potomac. It did not matter what kind of rebuff the president came up with because the point was mute. But the question is, why not just go ahead and fire the guy? Surely, Lincoln had seen enough of McClellan with his case of the slows. The answer may surprise you. This is yet another point where politics raise their head in our story. Early November in the United States is fairly important for those of you who follow the political sphere. It is, after all, election season. And in 1862, these were the midterm elections for Mr. Lincoln. Getting rid of McClellan may not have been a wise move with voters who could be swayed to the Democratic leaning. Already, there were legitimate gains for the Democrats, a scary scenario that might have also seen New York even fall from its Republican tendency. 
It did not, and overall the Republicans were okay after the elections. This would be the appropriate time. Despite the army finally moving out after the Confederates toward Virginia, the fate was sealed for the young Napoleon. The only question remained who exactly would take over. Already they had tried a conservative Democrat. McClellan dabbled too much into politics, or at least too much into politics, without any kind of glowing success. They had also tried a more radical Republican in John Pope, and we saw how that ended up. Why not try somebody completely different? On November 7, 1862, a correspondence would be delivered from the War Department, giving Ambrose Burnside command of the Army and directing McClellan to return home to New Jersey. Now, Burnside, if you recall, had already been offered command of the Army prior to the Antietam campaign. He had declined partly because of his loyalty to McClellan and partly because of his internal doubt that he was the correct fit in that position. Remember, Burnside had been pre-war buddies with McClellan, and he owed Little Mac for his command that saw his success on the Carolina coast. But there was some souring of their relationship. Burnside had been upset at the removal of Joe Hooker from his wing command, that move had actually left Burnside with just the single 9th Corps, commanded by Reno and then Jacob Cox after Reno's death. We saw how there was a little bit of a confusion in terms of the chain of command. Obviously, Burnside really only has one subordinate to deal with instead of multiple, so that is something that perhaps leads to the slow nature of the action as it unfolds at Burnside's bridge. Even with the jilting of Burnside and the laying of some of the blame for not crushing Lee after the battle, this was not enough for Burnside to completely turn his back on his friend. But instead of leaning on the fact that he was friends with McClellan, he would lean more toward the reason already stated of his ineptitude, which probably is not a reassuring sign if you're trying to put the man into a command position. Oddly enough, once Burnside found out Hooker was the other choice, he was ready to move forward with command. Burnside does not like Hooker. Hooker does not like Burnside. Burnside thought Hooker to be rash, much like him, the wrong choice to lead. So, in his mind, it was going to be the lesser of two evils if he was in command rather than Hooker. Burnside would accompany the officer to inform McClellan, who would take his sacking in stride. He would depart on a train, passing through cheering troops, wishing for him to stay. Some of the men reportedly would actually unhinge his car, only stopping when addressed by their former general. But there were some who were ready to see him leave, blaming him for their reversal in fortune at the peninsula, and then not simply winning the war after Antietam. The army was ready to continue the fight after the bloody day, but the general officers did not continue, and thus they were blamed. Despite not being of the number who were glad to see McClellan go, Burnside would push on. We're going to see that there is a good amount of criticism that's heaped onto Burnside, but it's hard not to feel for the guy. We'll get a little more in depth in a later episode, but Burnside's appeal to the Lincoln administration was that the general did not have any political motivation. Not a Democrat like Little Mac or a Republican like Pope. He was simply guilty of being a good soldier. Burnside will start the army moving toward Fredericksburg after taking the reins. Confederate forces had divided and were split between Winchester and Culpeper, retooling for a new campaign. In fact, Lee's ranks were being supplemented by the troops he might have benefited from in the invasion of Maryland through conscriptions and reinforcements. 
this change of base toward Fredericksburg was a new route, an overland route to the rebel capital. In the meantime, Lee would officially switch his army makeup to a core system, one under Jackson and one under Longstreet, trusting his two lieutenants to larger commands. The Union Army would also reorganize. Burnside would change the makeup of the army into three grand divisions, a fourth being held in reserve. Sumner, Hooker, and Franklin would be the grand division commanders, with Siegel in command of the reserve division. Sumner would have the 2nd and 9th Corps under Couch and Wilcox. Hooker would have the 3rd and 5th Corps under Stoneman and Butterfield. Franklin would have the 1st and 6th Corps under Reynolds and Smith. Siegel would have the 11th and 12th Corps under Stahl and Slocum. Both armies would suffer supply problems and poor road conditions in the winter. Remember that the northern part of the state was pretty much strip of forage by both armies, most notably Pope, who lived off the land. We are going to get into further operations in the area leading up to the disastrous Battle of Fredericksburg. In fact, we will actually have to backtrack a little to get the full picture, but rest assured we will set the stage properly. But all of that can wait for now. Now we need to draw our conclusions on George B. McClellan. He has been in our story since early 1861 in West Virginia, and to be fair, he will step back into our story as a civilian. Final judgments need to be passed by us for the young Napoleon. Now we will go over some of his operations directly after Antietam next week, so he's not really done with our story, but now is as good a time as any to take stock of his performance as commander of the Army of the Potomac, as well as his stint as overall commander of the Federal Forces. I know I have been harsh on McClellan, but let's start with some positives. The first that I do not think we highlighted very well was his capability as an inspirational leader. He sparked morale amongst the troops which is illustrated very well in Bruce Catton's Mr. Lincoln's Army. Many wrote about how joyous they were following his placement at the helm, following 2nd Manassas once again. But why exactly do the troops find Little Mac so appealing? Well, first and foremost, he was advertised as the savior, the genius who was going to win the war. Enough with the older generals, this was a young, energetic commander with much promise. If you think about it, would you rather have your football team led by a older, veteran quarterback? Or would it be more exciting to have an individual who maybe just won the Heisman or the national championship, a younger quarterback come in and take the reins? That is sort of the scenario that we have here. He was going to continue in his string of victories and whip the Confederates. Add this sentiment along with his charisma, and you have a popular general. The troops also appreciated that he wished to save as many lives as possible. Now in war, lives will be lost, but there needs to be a certain amount of risk involved if victory is to be obtained. It is documented that McClellan does not want to be responsible for the deaths of his men. After the Battle of Williamsburg, he is not the same. For this, he was also loved by his men. Another positive was that he was a good organizer. Before Antietam, McClellan was able to put the army together, and he does not have a whole lot of time to do it. Without him it might not have worked out so well beating back Lee's incursion into Maryland. South Mountain shows his high watermark though, probably his best plan. Now despite the strategy involved in his attack at South Mountain, you might also point at that and say, well, he had to have been given the enemy orders to get to that point, but still, it is probably the best battle that McClellan wages during the war. The negatives are a bit more numerous, but we can lump them together as his decision-making. 
That sounds very harsh, but George has been described as a linear thinker. That is a polite way to say he is inflexible. Once a plan was created then, he had a hard time changing or adapting to what was going on in the battle. We see that in several places. We can even point at Antietam. And now I, I don't think that Antietam is this big missed opportunity. Oh, he gets a lot of criticism for this battle, but he does get the job done. He is attacking Lee, which is a little bit different. He probably also does not have the kind of manpower that is listed on paper, but there is no deviation from the battle plan, right? There's an attack to the north by Hooker, there's an attack by Burnside at his bridge, and that's pretty much how we're going to play it, right? So it's fair to criticize him, I think, for the battle while also saying that he did a good job. Likewise, everything needed to be just so. Every soldier needed to be equipped before he was able to move the army. This is still part of his linear thinking, I believe. There is a lot of pressure on McClellan, though. I would imagine that anyone who is touted as being a savior might feel that way. For this, we can be sympathetic. My final thoughts are this. McClellan was not ready to be the savior for the Union. He had a lot of pressure that is unfairly heaped on him. Was he able to rise to the occasion? No. The generals in this war who I think are most admirable are the ones who learn and adapt as the war progresses. Take Sherman and Grant. They have many setbacks but are able to persevere. Is there something to be said about Grant getting a softened army to fight toward the end of the war in the east? That does remain to be seen, but we cannot overlook the many advantages that McClellan has. Several times, he has the ability to end the war regardless of the potential parity between the armies, so for that, we need to put an X on his evaluation. But please do not let me sway your opinion. I hope that throughout these episodes, you have come up with one of your own. And if you would like to share it with me, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. So, also this week, we have a raid conducted by Federal Cavalry. Specifically, it is conducted by Colonel Benjamin Grimes Davis. Now, we have already maybe mentioned Grimes Davis, who broke free at Harper's Ferry. Davis was a Southerner by birth and would approve a capable cavalry officer who wished to look after his men and their horses, a priority he put above others. His men had captured Longstreet's reserve ammunition train before Antietam, so already he has seen some success. In early 1862, there would be further cavalry action at a place called Chester Gap, or Barbie Crossroads, pitting Wade Hampton against more of Pleasanton's cavalry. Here we have the report from Davis that describes this action. On leaving Piedmont, in the morning the regiment was placed in the rear of the leading section of artillery and followed in this order until we came up with the enemy. The guns were placed in position and I was directed to support them. But before the regiment was formed, I was ordered by General Pleasanton in person to move towards a mill, which was on our right, in front, and operate in that direction. By taking advantage of hollows and ravines, we reached the mill unmolested, but on attempting to pass the crest, were met by severe fire of spherical case from the enemy's artillery, which was posted on a commanding eminence about 600 yards to our left and front. The enemy's cavalry would also be seen in large force in the other end of a field about a quarter of a mile distant. The regiment was halted momentarily behind the crest and dispositions made to attack. Captain Mann's squadron was dismounted and sent along a stone wall which was somewhat in the direction of their guns with orders to drive away their skirmishers and if he could get close enough to pick off their gunners. <laughs> 
The other three squadrons were then moved over the hill into the field and placed behind some high ground to screen them from the artillery fire, which was at this time very severe. The enemy's cavalry were also hidden from view by high ground at the other extremity of the field. Captain Pope's small squadron of 50 men was then thrown forward as skirmishers toward a piece of woods to the right and front. The regiment opposite to me proved to be the 1st North Carolina, and the commanding officer seeing Captain Pope's squadron, and supposing it alone, immediately ordered a charge. The captain ordered his men to rally in the corner of the field to my right and rear, and the enemy came dashing after him at full speed, and with loud cheers. From an eminence on which I was standing, I galloped back to the reserve squadrons, brought them up over the hill, and charged the enemy somewhat obliquely, just as the main body had arrived nearly opposite to our position. Although less than half their numbers, the charge was made with such vigor and intrepidity that he hesitated, pulled up, opened fire with pistol and carbines, and finally, as the leading files were closing upon him, turned about and fled in the utmost confusion. The men followed with the greatest eagerness close up on the reserves, sabering and taking prisoners at every step. Knowing that a regiment was in reserve ready to call on in case the pursuit was followed too far, I ordered the men to rally in the woods on our right, already referenced to. This was done by owing to the confusion that necessarily follows a successful charge, not without considerable delay. I think that just as a side note here, and this isn't part of uh, Davis's account here, obviously, but I think just as an aside here, we do talk a lot about, you know, charges by infantry and cavalry, and that really does lose cohesion if you think about it. So it does take these troops a long time to reform after such an event occurs. So there's always accounts in many of these source books about, you know, battles and it says this unit's reforming, this units taking time to get back into ranks and it does take time it's kind of like you always hear that analogy about herding cats right well i would imagine it to be you know fairly similar but here let's get back to davis i should have mentioned that a part of the enemy's leading squadron had anticipated the main body and had reached the corner of the field in pursuit of our skirmishers when they were opened upon by a sharp fire from Captain Mann's dismounted squadron and driven back, most of them making their escape through the woods on the right. Quite a number of prisoners also made their escape in the same manner for want of a reserve to pick them up. As soon as the command was rallied, Captain Pope's squadron was again thrown forward in the woods as skirmishers and was fast gaining a position to their left and rear when the 3rd Indiana reached me as support. I ordered it forward to attack, the enemy now in full retreat, and informed Major Chapman that I would follow closely and give him support. Whilst proceeding to execute this order, the Major was called by a counter-order from General Pleasanton to go to the rear and support guns. That's another thing that I think we, we don't often talk about in terms of these battles, is that you could be having your brigade and you could be commanding them as such, and you might have a commander who's not on the field of battle who doesn't understand the situation, and they're coming over here and they're countermanding your orders because they outrank you, right? So that's another thing that we can think about in some of these situations where if you have somebody who's not trusting their subordinate officers and they're micromanaging the situation, you know, it might not always produce the best result. I then recalled Captain Pope and moved the regiment to the front but by this time, the enemy's columns had safely retreated and taken up a position with their artillery a mile or so in the rear. Understanding no pursuit was to be made, I repaired to the rear and reported myself to the general in person. The result of the charge was five of the enemy left dead on the field, one captain, and 15 non-commissioned officers and privates taken prisoner. We had one man, Pat, of Company E, killed by a blow from a saber, and six wounded. Two of the wounded who were taken prisoner 
report that the enemy buried that night six of their men who were mortally wounded in the charge. I cannot conclude this report without claiming for the cavalry service in general, and my regiment in particular, this was a complete and thorough repulse of a charge of cavalry by a counter charge, although the enemy outnumbered us at least two to one. In regard to the conduct of the officers and men, I can make no discrimination. As far as I could see and hear, every officer and man behaved in a courageous and soldier-like manner. We will get into the significance of this fighting when we talk about what has been going on up to McClellan's removal, but it should definitely be pointed out the lack of respect shown Federal cavalry when compared to the usually considered superior horsemen from the South. Pleasanton's cavalry in this region in 1862 will perform well against their enemy, probably for the first time starting to see parity between the sides. And for that reason, we have this great account from Grimes Davis, which kind of starts to illustrate that fact for us. Let's call it quits. We have a big move in the change in command for the Army of the Potomac. Next week, we will make sure to go over some of the campaigning around the move for the armies back into Virginia. This is actually going to include something we skipped over, the second ride around McClellan for Jeb Stewart. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great week. Mm -hmm.